Hello and welcome to this week's edition of It's Your City. I'm Courtney Bloomer and we're here in our studios at the Brewery Arts Center with this week's guest, Supervisor Brad Bunkowski. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Courtney. I'm happy to be here. We're thrilled to have you. We've got a lot going on in Carson City. I'm excited to get your take on some of the stuff that is going on uh, with the downtown project and some of the redevelopment initiatives that are happening here in our community. I know you have a lot of uh, involvement with the real estate community and, and uh, development here in Carson. So uh, excited to talk a little bit about some of the things that are coming down the pike. Uh, let's start with something that came up uh, just at the uh, Board of Supervisors meeting yesterday, and that is the Planning Commission. Yes. You guys uh, have uh, appointed two new members to the Planning Commission, um, and some of our viewers might not um, understand exactly what it is that the Planning Commission does. Talk a little bit about that and uh, uh, what you're looking for them in the upcoming uh, few months. That's a great topic, Courtney. Um, that's actually a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I think that there's a lot of people in the public um, that don't understand exactly what the Planning Commission does. And their job is to vet projects that are coming in front of the city to make sure that they comply with the, the municipal code and, and the building codes. Um, so when a project is um, brought forward by a builder or developer, it goes through planning and the building departments and the plans are approved and then the project comes forward to the Planning Commission to make sure that it complies with zoning, uh, the municipal code, uh, all the other portions of that that need to be approved and then if the Planning Commission approves it and then it has to still go to the Board of Supervisors for final approval. So the Planning Commission is sort of a preliminary step uh, before the Board of Supervisors goes ahead and reviews those final plans. It's, it's the place where the project will be vetted to work out any, um, any hurdles or any uh, major problems before it comes to the Board. So we've got a project right now that's in that phase working out some of those uh, major hurdles and, and getting on track a little bit and that's the Capital Mall project. Yes. The Capital Mall project uh, for, for folks in town who might not know is a new development that's going to uh, potentially uh, go in downtown near uh, the Carson Nugget. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about that project. Right, that project, uh, the proposed project, would be on basically about eight acres behind the Nugget. And it involves, the first phase would be a parking garage to replace the parking that would be used for the rest of the development. And then a hotel uh, without any casino um, behind where the Nugget is and then adjacent to that hotel will be an office building and then another parking garage and then another office building and in the first office building there'll be convention space that would be used in conjunction with the hotel so it's an exciting project uh, and it would really change the face of downtown Carson City and it is just coming to the Planning Commission on the, I believe, the 27th of this month. Next Wednesday, I right. think. So it's still in the preliminary stages. Um, as with any project, when it is going through the entitlement process and the design process, everything is subject to change. But that's the preliminary project. Right. So, so what, do you, uh, what do you see as, uh, how is this interacting with uh, some of the other things that are going on downtown, like the downtown redesign project? Does this relate to that at all? In reality, it doesn't, although there are uh, intersecting effects between the projects because they will affect traffic, um, they will affect the retail component of downtown by, uh, the, like the, the Capital Mall project is a private project brought forward by a private developer. So it's really off the radar, uh, much more so than say a, a public works project like the corridor improvement projects, which is completely vetted in, in the public. That doesn't happen on a private development. It really isn't vetted in the public till it gets to the planning commission. So in that way they're different, but because they would both affect the downtown core, there are certain components like traffic and re, uh, utility replacements, things of that nature, that we would want to try to coordinate. Absolutely. So even though this isn't uh, a public project, not something directly related to uh, those uh, one eight cent 
tax improvements that we've been hearing about, it still could be tied in with that from the utility standpoint while they're while they're doing some of these, uh, you know, uh, upgrading our utilities that are downtown, accommodating this building. I mean, having a hotel down there, there there's going to be more water usage and more electrical usage and things like that. Is that something that they're going to take into account during the construction phase? On the corridor improvement project, all the utility replacements will be um, done by the city. And some of that will come out of the enterprise funds. A smaller portion of it could come out of the eight cent um, tax funding. Uh, on the private develop development, it'll be more of a hybrid. The city is typically responsible for utility replacements up to the property line. And then the developer is responsible for all of the utilities from the property line to the improvements, which would be the buildings or the parking garage. So it's more of a hybrid. And as I think most people know, we have very old utility lines being water and sewer lines, especially through the downtown core. We have some clay pipe down there that's 60 to 80 years old. Those lines are in the process of being replaced anyway, either through the enterprise funds in our normal sewer water line replacement program or through the corridor improvement uh, project, or in this case, the developer can come in and ask the city to expedite the portion of the utility lines that would go to the project so that right. he can complete his portion of the project. Okay, so that, that kind of clarifies things a little bit for folks who might be wondering how this project uh, goes with some of the other things that are already happening. Right. Uh, another thing that, that that sort of brings to mind is something that's been a discussion recently at the Board of Supervisors, and that's these utility connection fees. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, these new developments that are happening. Um, uh, uh, subdivisions that are that are looking at coming in these projects downtown and the innovation district and the convention center and those sorts of things um, what is the discussion surrounding uh, the utility hookup fees I know that that's kind of been postponed uh, where are you at on that it, it was postponed because at least my feeling was that we didn't have quite enough information to implement all of the recommendations that were um, brought forward by the Utility Oversight Committee. Um, most of the recommendations are based on measurements of residential units. And my feeling was that we didn't have enough input from the commercial industrial segment dealing with commercial hookup fees. And to give you an example, um, the recommendation from the Oversight Committee was to take a residential connection fee from approximately $500 up to about um, $4,500 over the course of a five-year period. So that connection fee would then be $4,500. When you're talking about a, a commercial or industrial connection fee, you are sometimes talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. So I didn't think that it was appropriate to base those fees without really knowing what the fees were going to be or having input from commercial uh, industrial developers on the impact of raising those fees on our ability to use it as an economic development tool. So if we've been trying to recruit, and this is a, an actual example from the past few years, a yogurt, a yogurt manufacturer, which is a high water okay. user, their connection fee can be two and a half million dollars. So. For us to be able to recruit a company like that here that would provide hundreds of jobs, we need to have the ability to either have the option of keeping those connection fees lower so that we have a competitive advantage over our neighboring counties, or the ability to have an abatement or waiver program of those connection fees, uh, again, to use as an economic development tool to try to recruit, recruit those companies here rather than our surrounding uh, counties. So, so when, go ahead. So we've we've asked the utility oversight committee to hold another meeting and get more input on the commercial side of the connection fees and then bring it back to us with a whole package. And that is supposed to happen it'll probably happen in the next couple of months. So at at that time we'll be able to get a a, a little better picture of, of this commercial side of development. I know people are concerned about the commercial side of development because, uh, as we all know, with uh, Tesla moving into the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, um, other companies are now looking at this area with sort of a renewed interest. And we certainly want to uh, be able to provide them a home here in Carson City. 
We have a short window of opportunity. Um, the Tesla facility should be completed by the end of 2017. Um, most of the companies that will move here because of Tesla will be purchasing land or purchasing buildings prior to the point to where they open. So we have about a two-year window to try to attract companies here, uh, and I just don't want to miss out on that window. I think that we need to be economically competitive in attracting business and jobs here, and so we, we need to have that information available so that we know what we're getting into. Well, and attracting business and jobs here, um, another part of attracting business and jobs to our area, of course, is attracting the people who are going to work mm -hmm. in those jobs to our area. What plans uh, do you have that you'd like to see happen to make uh, those employees choose Carson City as their relocation area of choice as opposed to, you know, buying a home in Reno or something? The plans are in place, and fortunately for Carson City and in our Sierra region, um, we had some foresight and we started working on this about five or six years ago with NNDA and with WNC and with Carson High School. Uh, and now the library is also involved. Um, so we have um, been able to put in place programs through um, the Governor's Office of Economic Development and NNDA and WNC and the high school to where we're writing specific curriculum for our local manufacturers and training job positions that can actually go right from either their accreditation or uh, achieving their degree directly into job placement. The, the issue that we're running into is that we don't have enough people entering those programs to fill the jobs that are available. Uh, there are many uh, high-skill, high-tech jobs that are available out there that are just going unfilled. So we need to put more students into the pipeline, into these programs. My concern is that the current budget for the community colleges is being cut, which means that there's the potential for these workforce development programs to be cut, which then affects our ability to recruit new companies because they're not going to come here if we don't have workers for their jobs. Absolutely. Now, Governor Sandoval's uh, budget does, he, he has a strong focus on education in the state, specifically K-12 education. Are there ways that we here in Carson City could uh, leverage some of that to provide our high school students with uh, better preparedness to enter the job market? There's no doubt that we need to start with probably middle school uh, and then into high school, but the key component is that community college program, and that's my concern. Governor Sandoval's program addresses more funding for higher education, for the university system, and for K through 12, but we have this gap now, which I think is a critical gap, which is the community colleges. And of course, WNC, uh, our local uh, community college here, which serves a, a great number of people in our region. Exactly. Exactly. Now, we do have some other things that you mentioned the library get invol getting involved. They now have the, the manufacturing certificate program. Right, first that, in the nation. That they're doing there, which is a real breakthrough. How did that come about? Well, again, it's a collaboration, and that's another thing that Carson City has been very good at is collaboration between, uh, between partners. Uh, and again, this started during the depths of the recession when everybody was uh, cognizant that um, that partnerships work better than isolation, than working in silos. And not only have we seen that through the nonprofits in our area and through the educational systems, but also with the counties where uh, Lyon, Douglas, Story, Carson counties are working together very well now on a lot of uh, multiple uh, uh, issues. So the library getting involved, you know, they have been very innovative in looking uh, at ways to not only grow into the 22nd century library, um, but also reaching out into economic development and workforce development where, frankly, they should be. Absolutely, and it's a great resource for our community to be able to go there, not just for the certificate, but for, uh, you know, to be able to access uh, internet resources and, and right. some of those uh, technical resources that the library has on hand now as well. You're exactly right. Most job applications are now done via the internet, uh, online, which is a big change uh, for a lot of people, especially uh, if you don't have a job, you may not have other internet access other than to be able to go to the library. So they are filling a critical uh, gap in the ability for people to find good paying jobs. 
Absolutely. So uh, we've got a number of things going on all at once. It's kind of the perfect storm here in Carson mm -hmm. City of uh, of development. We've got a lot of things uh, going our way. Um, in your opinion, what's the number one thing that Carson City needs to do going forward to maximize uh, and capitalize on uh, the things that are happening regionally to help grow our economy here in Carson City? I think that we need to grow smart. And what I mean by that is that we need to attract high-tech, high-paying jobs uh, in the manufacturing sector and in the tech sector, uh, specifically the medical tech factor. Um, that is a, a large growth area, and we are really well positioned geographically to do that. We talk to a lot of companies that their market is California, but they don't want to be in California because of the regulatory burden and the tax burden that they see there. So we have geography going for us. Uh, we have quality of life going for us. Uh, I think that a lot of people have put a lot of time and energy into putting in place infrastructure to make Carson City and our surrounding areas successful. And now it's just a matter of continuing down that path and making little adjustments as we go and, you know, just not backing off at this point. We need to be aggressive. We have maybe a two to four year window to make all this work and we need to be there. All right, fantastic. Last question. Mm -hmm. uh, you are uh, a person who really enjoys the outdoors. You, you yes. ride bikes, you hunt, you fish, all of, all of that kind of thing. Um, to someone who's gonna move to Carson City, to these prospective mm -hmm. businesses, to these prospective uh, workers that are gonna come here, what do you tell them uh, is the best thing about living in Carson City? It is the outdoors. Um, it is the quality of life that we have here. And I have traveled all over the world. And when I come back to Carson City from being in another country or on another continent, this is home. It feels like home. I've never found any place else that was more comfortable and had a better quality of life than right here. Thank you, Supervisor Bonkowski, for joining us this week. And thanks to all of you for joining us this week. Check in again next week for another edition of It's Your City.